Coming up on This Week in Google, I, Micah Sargent, am joined by Jeff Jarvis, as you might imagine, but also by Stacey Higginbotham. Yes, Stacey is here for this episode. We start by talking about the right to repair, but for your body. Yeah, it's all about DIY pirated medicine. Then we talk about how Google and the Internet Archive are working together to make sure that old versions of web pages are a little bit easier to access. Uh, we talk about Stacy's work on making sure that older gadgets stick around for a while longer so that those bricked smart home devices don't remain bricked. Um, the AI fix for essays and our conversation surrounding uh, understanding when something is written by AI versus written by a human, plus so much more, including driverless cars and the awesome permission slip app from Consumer Reports. You are not going to want to miss this episode of Twig, so stay tuned for lots of fun. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twig. Twig. This is This Week in Google, episode 785, with Jeff Jarvis, Stacey Higginbotham, and me, Micah Sargent. Recorded Wednesday, September 11th, 2024. Froganize your phone. It's time for This Week in Google, the show that is ostensibly about Google, but very rarely about Google. I am Micah Sargent, filling in for Leo Laporte this week, who is floating on a boat somewhere or something. I honestly don't know what he's doing at this moment, uh, but I am pleased to say I am in the driver's chair today, the driver's seat today, uh, and I am excited to welcome back a face that you will be familiar with because he's here um, almost every week, if not every week. Can't it's get Jeff rid Jarvis. Of Can't get rid of me. Hello there. <laughs> Hi, I Jeff. Okay, this is the part where where you say the long title, except I don't have yeah, the long have title it. in front of me. All we do is sing Craig Newmark, and that's it. That's the important Oh, good. Okay, good. Craig, Craig Newmark. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Benito. Uh, <laughs> Wait, did we, the title get longer? Uh, uh, kind of, but now it's actually shorter than that because now I am emeritus, which is Latin for old. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard that voice, but it is not the typical there it voice is. one would expect. It's Stacy Higginbotham. It's Welcome back, Stacy. Oh, I'm so excited to be back and I'm excited to do a show with you, Micah, because usually we only get to talk about like the smart home and random Android phones. So this is so much like super fun. I agree. I'm very excited. And for folks who are listening to the show, um, I just want to say that you should totally check out the video at some point because Stacey has the coolest bandana on. So fashionable. Everybody needs to see As it. ever. <laughs> that's that's how I roll. Well, maybe you can do like for your socials, you could be like snap a photo, Stacey and the bandana. Boom. There you go. And uh, by the way, we say hello to Paris, uh, who is in Croatia, or at least was a couple of days ago. So um, we will see. We will see Paris again. Leo soon. and Paris and I had lunch in New York on Friday, and then oh, nice. Paris flew out that evening uh, for um, Croatia to sit on beaches. And then Leo and Lisa went on to a ship to go up to Canada. After a meetup they had on Saturday, which I didn't make it to, but looked like it was rather wet, and then a photo walk. It did look very wet, yes. Um, I Hopefully the photo walk was, I mean, I guess you could take really cool artsy photos with raindrops all over lenses or something. Or I don't you know just go into the works. subways, and they were going to go to the, uh, the into, into Grand Central, and then they were going to go down to the um, the path train that looks like a station that looks like a dead whale. So there's fun stuff you could do there. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. can get out of the rain, I guess. That's true. <laughs> um, well, let's kick off the show this week with an interest. Look, I don't have strange Bitcoin uh, names to talk about or, or really wild internet topics, I've got to say. That's usually um, something that at least every time I've hosted the show, that's what the show's kicked off with. But Stacey, the last time that Micah hosted the show, we embarrassed him hugely. I can't oh. remember what the topic was. Oh, that's true. Um, because <laughs> yeah. we were talking. About, I, I don't. We were talking about a 
robotics. Um, basically, they had found a way to right. make human skin, yes. um, kind of make a face uh, with robotics. And it was all about figuring out how to put skin over a layer of robotics and have it attach and be able to move naturally. But for some reason, we got onto the topic of where did they get that skin? And I'm not going to say where they got that Par skin. Paris went looking and it was a little embarrassing. It was a little embarrassing, but uh, Paris's oh. journalistic uh, <laughs> techniques were incredible yes. and came up with the frightening answer. Anyway, speaking Wait, of- Could you tell your children about it or is it not fit for children? If you anato if, speaking anatomically, yes, you could tell your children about it. Um, right. But you wouldn't want them thinking about that for too long because yeah, they're young. Right. Because Got they're it. young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah. I feel like I know. And that's exactly where I thought this was going to go. Uh, well, that's where it went. <laughs> Which means I'm broken inside. How exciting. <laughs> it's a little frightening <laughs> that you went there right away because I did not go there at all until it happened. And I thought, is that where we get it? Anyway, um, there's conversation <laughs> now about the right to repair for your body. Uh, how appropriate. Um, Speaking of the need for skin out of nowhere, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so this is... This is an interesting conversation because when I first heard about this, I thought that this was going to be about, um, you know, getting uh, robotic parts and needing to a little bit like uh, what is that? That Repo Man uh, movie. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but uh, it's essentially a movie about people who need hearts or or kidneys or livers or whatever it happens to be they get them but they pay for them over time and if they stop paying then the repo man comes and takes away their their kidney um this is about the rise of diy pirated medicine and i don't know about you but i have to say the thought of pirated medicine yeah yeah this is really struck me as odd terrifying concept no well, so there's actually, I don't know, I I think it was Annalise Newitz did a book called Autonomous, and there is like one thread of that is there's this whole community of biohackers that are both hacking, that, that build drugs for people and therapeutics for people, and maybe body parts, I don't remember, um, and kind of talks about, basically, it's the same as the open source model for security, which is like, if you throw it out there. Um, enough people will review it and rank it and tell you if it's good. And so things get more secure over time. It's kind of like that idea with like biohacking and or building your own drugs. And so you had in the book people who were like credible and they could charge a little more, um, but it was still less than like the big drug companies. Anyway. <laughs> but is it, yeah. but is it, does it produce the drugs that you otherwise would get? Or is it whole new drugs that we thought of that you should try? There were both, I feel. I, and, Forgive me, it's been like two to three years, but yes. In this case, they are doing both, right? They're doing, I'm doing, <laughs> I was going to say back alley abortion drugs. Oh no. Um, but they're, they're trying to. We may end produce, up with their. I mean, that's, uh, I, that's, yeah, they're, they're making, um, and now. Uh, misoprostol? Yeah, misoprostol. Thank you. Misoprostol. Um, which is sold for $160, but they were able to manufacture it for 89 cents and then provide it for free to folks. They also worked on the um, hepatitis C drug Sovaldi, which is uh, sort of gen, uh, generic name is Sofusbuvir <laughs> or something like that. Um, but they talk about how, uh, you know, other drugs that treat viruses um, are, they, they kind of like suppress the virus. Um, so Valdi actually cures the virus. Um, your body fights it off, your body fights it to a standstill, and then you just kind of have it in your system for a while. But with Savaldi, it actually goes in and what they say drains the viral reservoir. Um, those pills for Savaldi are patented. They cost $1,000 per pill. So you you have this instance of something being very expensive. Um, and I can understand how in this case, you would want to have someone 
be able to have access to a drug that, you know, until it becomes a generic offering is much more costly, make it so that it can be used for the people who need it. Uh, instead of having to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, they say just a little under $70, 83 cents per pill, um, to give the person like the, uh, to teach people how to make their own version of Savaldi. So yeah, they're teaching people how to make medications that cost so much money to uh, purchase. But there's a lot of trouble that it's comes a, in here, right? <laughs> there's know? a real clear cut. There's several clear cut issues. One, mm -hmm. we have the FDA for the for a reason, mm -hmm. and the manufacturer of drugs is it fair like. This clean room, it's like semiconductor manufacturing. There's clean rooms, there's like super processes in place to ensure the purity of your drugs. And if we want to see what happens when we don't have that, look at like the supplement market, which you can argue doesn't kill people on the regular, but you can also argue it does put lead in your turmeric or whatever also on the regular, right? Two, this is straight up IP theft. And if our issue is that, you know, we have let drug companies charge too much for drugs, um, because of maybe the healthcare system that we have, maybe there's some other reasons for that. That's something we can tackle, but like straight up saying this stuff is too expensive. So I'm just going to, I'm going to figure, I'm going to reverse engineer it and then build it. I mean, we do actually have pretty clear cut rules against that. Yeah. yeah there, and there's, 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 um, the question of because it is not acquired through prescription, then it's not going to go through medical prescription and advice. And so you could get something that may be bad for you and without the, the structures there. Uh, the manufacturing, as you just said, Stacy, could be off. And there's IP too, all of which doesn't cure the problem that our drug manufacturing system <clears throat> is horrible and greedy and awful in so many ways. I went to give a keynote at a major pharmaceutical company in uh, Switzerland some years ago. And what got me when I got there is the entire talk is it's, it's an entirely an industry of we find molecules. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. we, we find a molecule, we test it like crazy, we see whether it works. Uh, in the testing, most things fail. And, and there's difficulty like finding um, test subjects and so on, which is very expensive. And now they're using AI to try to find new molecules, and that may be helpful. They don't share terribly well across the industry, so people end up making the same test with the same failures without the knowledge, as in the academe, where they would share it. There's all kinds of reforms that I do think we need in pharma. So I get the spirit behind this, absolutely. I get the desire to make medications uh, cheaper and life-saving for those who need it. But I think what it really says is this is not the right system. It tells us how bad our existing system is. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a, a good way to put it. This is just, it's the same thing as those um, allegedly heartfelt and, and heart uh, warming videos of the daughter or son or child who opens a lemonade stand to raise money for their uh, mom who has cancer. And then it gets all over the news, the local news. And then the person makes, you know, $80,000 because people are paying a hundred dollars per cup of lemonade. And in the, on the, on the face of it, you go, wow, look at, look at what's able to happen mm -hmm. when people come together. And then you look at the underlying thing there, which is holy cow. We don't have the health insurance necessary to make sure that this mom who has yep. a, a child or children can't get access to the health care that they need because of Again, the the healthcare industry. It, it is a second second take kind of thing. I also think about um, I think about the folks who were convinced that um, they needed to get doses of what is that horse um, horse ivermectin? Yeah, ivermectin. You know, everybody was uh, I've got hey, a yeah. ivermectin source. I can get ivermectin here. I can get ivermectin there. The poor um, horses didn't get it anymore. It was yeah, so there was so none old. for the horses, those poor right. horses. Um, but it makes me think of, yeah, folks who have uh, have sort of clinical 
Um, and now I'm forgetting the term as well, where you you start to believe that you've got these different conditions and you're trying to treat those different conditions. Yeah, hypochondria. Yeah, thank you, hypochondria. Um, we are so your we, thesaurus. Thank you very much. My, <laughs> my brain is somewhere else today for sure. Um, trying to get access to medications they don't need to take, but because it's yeah. easy for them to do so or easier for them to do so, oh. then they're like, oh yeah, I probably have hepatitis C because I read it on the internet. And now I'm taking this drug that would otherwise require a lot of process to actually get access to. <sighs> Yeah, not to mention drug interactions. I mean, there's a reason doctors yeah. prescribe drugs, and mm -hmm. there's a reason they go to medical school for like a really long time. Um, what do we say though to the people who are who would call us in this instance gatekeepers because we're, you know, we are gate, we are gate. I mean, look, the world is complicated and nuanced. We are gatekeeping because the risk of harms of letting anyone through the gate is pretty high in this situation, right? Mm -hmm. The in we will be gatekeeping against some very legitimate cases and users. And right now the whole system's gatekeeping. So it feels great to come and storm those gates, but it's probably it it's not the way to go. I mean yeah. it, it proves a point. That's valuable, but I'm not taking the drugs. Yeah. I <laughs> somebody said, it, hey, look, I've got this, it's good. I'd say no. Think about okay. the potential for manipulation. So think about like how easy it would be in this world to, uh, let's say you're a big competitor and you have no regard for human life. You could actually poison the well in terms of putting out a bad recipe and then blaming, you know, whatever drug is your competitor, right? So like, there's a lot of opportunities for people to behave really terribly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's go ahead and talk about something that I think is near and dear to all of us here on this show, which is uh, the Internet Archive. It is a source of the, the, the history of the Internet and has been a tool that I have used for years and years to find earlier versions of web pages and, and find things that have been taken down. Journalists use it. Um, and then, of course, on top of just being uh, that way back machine tool, it is also so much more um, in the sense that it is a, a database of so much of what humans have created uh, online. And unfortunately, the Internet Archive uh, did lose its appeal um, over ebook lending. Um, I just had uh, Kate Nibs of Wired on Tech News Weekly um, to talk about this appeal and kind of what all happened here. And it was an interesting conversation because one aspect of this is that the Internet Archive doesn't necessarily does it is it does not make a profit, um, and it is a not for profit organization. However, uh, part of the part of the ruling that was involved in all of this was the uh, prominent donation button on the Internet Archive's uh, page, and the fact that by providing access in this case to books and uh, bringing people to the site and giving them a way to uh, provide money to the organization that actually played a role in the decision that came through. Um, I wanted to hear how, how you, you two are feeling uh, about this, what you think about this um, and where, where things stand for you, at least if you feel like this was the right choice uh, during this appeal. Stacey. I'm going to let you go first. I mean, I'm, I love the Internet Archive. I mean, in full disclosure, the book I have coming out on sale next, next month, um, Web Discount, Web, Web 20 Discount Code, is from Hachette. And Hachette brought this. And I'm really unhappy about that connection, frankly. Um, they're a publisher. They're all publishers. They all agree about all this stuff. Uh, but I want my books to be read. Uh, I want it there. Uh, it's not in their interest, but but I officially own the copyright, but I license it to them and I lose control over it. That's the essence of copyright. It was not done for authors. 
And all this talk about how, oh, this hurts the authors terribly. It doesn't hurt the authors. The sales that may be affected by Internet Archive probably increases sales. We know that when the Internet made books available, uh, back titles were sold more and more because they were discovered more and more. And I don't think the data are there to really say uh, what this actually did in the marketplace. So I'm very upset about the decision. And as a researcher, air quotes researcher, not a real PhD or anything, you know, just a fake professor. Uh, but when I do my research for my books, uh, I use the Internet Archive like crazy, not for current books, uh, but for uh, older books, which I hope stay. The reporting is that 500,000 books have to come off Internet Archive. And I've got to believe that some of those are, <clears throat> you know, in the last century, um, in the now ridiculously extended copyright uh, terms we have, and that they're books that I would need and want to use. And I'm lucky I have access to an academic library, uh, but for anybody out there who's trying to get information, it just became harder. It became harder to discover the books. It's a kind of ridiculous greed. And the thing that I point out, and I write about this in my books, is that copyright was not intended to benefit creators. It was intended to create, it was demanded by the booksellers and the publishers because they wanted a, a content to be a tradable asset. And that's why, that's the same thing that's happened here. It's the publishers that came and did this. It doesn't be, benefit creativity. It pisses me off. Since you asked. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit middling on this um, only because... One, so so yes, literally the only way I can find probably like 80% of my entire work product is on the Internet Archive because I've worked for several publications that have gone Ooh, out of business. That so, too. Yep. Love it. Um, when it comes to the books, I don't feel that like I, I do think Hachette did an overreach here. The, the books that they have are not pleasant. They're not like eBooks. They're digital scans of like a physical book, right? They're not, they're like, it's like saying that I, you're getting access to like microfiche where you're sitting there like scrolling through on this awful thing and you would do it for only research purposes. So I don't think this was the right decision for something like that. I think when they did launch a program to like freely lend them out to people and make it more available, maybe that drew attention to something that was ultimately used more for research than for like gaming the system. So maybe the best way to do this is rethink or develop a licensing scheme that works for this because mm -hmm. even today, the way eBooks are licensed is really punitive for libraries. It's not yes. awesome. Yes. And if, if you look at the eBook space, it's a veritable monopoly. Um, so it's not like we're getting innovation and licensing from any of the players. So I guess that's what I, I'm like, what I'm like, the world is this way, but I would like it to be this way. It's going to be like mm -hmm. the theme apparently of me being here to this week. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. It's, um, a, it's the same argument about, about we hear about news. Can't we just have micropayments? which doesn't work as a business model. There's all kinds of reasons it doesn't work. But we need to figure out, especially as we move into the AI world, um, how people can people and companies can read more fluidly. And, we, and, and, and relying on a law from 1710 uh, in the UK and uh, 1790 in the US uh, just doesn't take into account these new realities. And access to trusted information is going to be more crucial than ever. Amen, sister. Could, is there like, is there a copyright exemption? So every three years you can go before the copyright office and get an exemption for certain things. I don't know if there could be an exemption for this. Maybe I'll look into that. Maybe well, the, the other something. thing about this is that when uh, the extension of copyright was, was, was bad enough. Thank you, yeah. Disney. But the real issue to me is that when copyright became automatic, as opposed to having to apply for it, and so it just it put the umbrella out over everything immediately. If copyright was still the subject of, of granting, if applied for, it would mean you have to go to the effort to apply for it and, um, and renew it. And I think that would be a, a fairer system for books that are out of print, that you can't get otherwise, that, um, that we need to be able to get through mechanisms like this. That's the main use of this. It's, it's an inconvenient way to read uh, Harry Potter. 
No one wants to read Harry Potter anymore. Don't worry yeah, about that's that. That's true, yeah. too. That's but true, too. Apparently, y'all talked about this last week. Yes, this is what I'm learning okay. as well. Um, this was apparently <laughs> but we still went on in all kinds of different ways. That was the first topic of last week, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, I, what's new and is still about the Internet Archive that I found interesting is that uh, as of, I believe, today, um, Google has announced that it will link to the Internet Archive to add more context to search results. Ooh. So Google is working with the Internet Archive directly to give you historical context in your search results. Now, we know that in the past, Google has had that little cache feature. So I do find this interesting that in this case, what we have is um, the company kind of I don't think it's going to necessarily farm out that feature. I imagine that we'll still see Google cached pages, but to have full on internet archive pages and for this to be like an actual partnership, they say, and I quote, we know that many, I quote nine to five Google that is quoting Google. We know that many people, including those in the research community, value being able to see previous versions of web pages when available. That's why we've added links to the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine to our About This Page feature to give people quick context and make this helpful information easily accessible through search. I think this is great because, yes, I've indexed it before, or I mean, I've looked at indexes before through Google search. And sometimes then I still have to take it to the Wayback Machine. And so now you'll see site first indexed by Google and it'll show you when, and then it says see previous versions on Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. So I think this is great because, again, with the Internet Archive kind of going through this whole appeal process and there being kind of a uh, tumult, uh, it's nice that we have, um, you know, big tech and the Internet Archive kind of working together to I, I like make that. the Internet better. Yeah. And, and, and you know, they do the same thing. Go ahead, Stacey. I was going to say it's 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 kind of nice since Google has totally screwed up their search results from an AI perspective True. and from a sponsorship perspective. Although I would worry that people will look at like sending someone to the Wayback Machine, depending on how they do it, it might just look sponsored and not as trustworthy, which would be unfortunate. Uh, just because I, I know when I search Google now, I'm like, I don't search Google now. I don't use it very often because it's terrible. Ooh, what's it your search engine of choice? I go back and forth. Like right now I'm doing DuckDuckGo still mm -hmm. and it's not great. And I even use Bing, which is really <gasps> not great. How weird. I know it, it's like, it's I want to know what people are. Yeah. I like in, I, I tried some of the paid search engines and Ugh. that's fine, but I really am very sad about it. Anyway, y'all go on. But you know, my theory, Stacey, is it, is that yeah, Google has done something's wrong, but I think that the problem is not Google. The problem is the web. Web is being just crammed full of crap. Well, yeah, but Google, Google is incentivize not, that. Yeah, Google incentivizes that. In, I mean, yes, yes, everything about the web is no longer as good as it once was. I mean, I'm I'm now like the old lady. Oh yeah, like, aren't we old? <laughs> Back in my day, <laughs> the internet was full of joy and fun. Um, but I, I am trying like. My goal when I go on the internet is is to search for accurate and relevant information and yep. that I can trust because you know as yes. a journalist that's what I'm doing right you can trust yes and I can get two out of three maybe on Google and that's not sufficient for me so have you uh, related all that? well two things one I think that Google by using Wikipedia which is open source and they had the perfect right to do so I think brought a lot more attention to Wikipedia and people who use it and I hope contribute to it. And I think it was a good thing that Google did. And it was branded so you know what you're getting. And I think that's clear. Do either of you ever use the Hathi Trust? The who? The Hathi what? Trust. Hathi Trust? H-A-T-H-I -H Trust. Oh, uh, Hathi. No, Hathi. I've never heard of that. Hathi. So it is the it is the outpouring, uh, the outcome of the Google book scanning. Oh. And it's quite oh. wonderful. Uh, because I find all kinds of publications and books on here that have been scanned oh. in university libraries across the country that you otherwise just couldn't get to. Conchological so illustrations. <gasps> oh, it's great stuff. It's phenomenal stuff. And this, again, goes back to Google. This is This Week at Google, so we're trying to be justified here, where um, you see it's a university library, and they scanned it, and now it's available to you. And you can search this text. 
Um, if you have if you have a library access, you can download a whole publication. That's hard to do uh, throughout. Unfortunately, it's a page at a time, but you can read it here, and uh, it's it's amazing. It's a it's a it's a tremendous resource that is possible only because of Google Book Search. You know, they say they pulled some of their data. It's they pulled some of it from the Internet Archive, actually, which is but there's cooperation there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm busy reading the ice cream review. You'll have to call me back <laughs> later. But yeah, is, no, this is great. Um, this is really cool. This isn't the sort of I mean, like, you know, in my job as a well, I'm not even even still in my job, but immediately prior to that, my journalist job, you know, for me, Google replaced the morgue, which is, you know, in your old school print publication, you had a room in the newspaper where you went and you had clippings and you would have to literally go through and find the files and read them. And like, I just had started as a journalist when search engines like got good. So like when Google launched and I had worked in a publication with the morgue and had seen the two things. And it was just like a sea change in the way you could actually do your job. Like it took, yes. it took hours off of writing something and all the way to now. And I'm like, I spend more time just digging through crap online. And I kind of miss the days of the morgue, which is saying a lot. But the morgue had librarians who literally clipped out everything and had their, their taxonomy and filed it for you. So they, okay, they I didn't, the I didn't work for the times when I started out. I, I worked for, you know, a, a local, <laughs> a local business journal and was an intern at the Statesman. <laughs> The statesman did have a library. <laughs> yeah, but, but you, your point being that that um, I had to go do it. I didn't have a librarian. Got it. We had we had a filing system, but but you had to go search through it. I mean, I'm with you. I'm going to leave this page because I will continue to read about this. <laughs> Found um, out anything interesting about ice cream there, Mecca? Honestly, it was just full of ads. So oh. it's just like the new web. Apparently, apparently, all we're talking about things being great. That that ice cream review, all it was was ad after ad after ad. Um, mm. But you know, yeah. Do we forget that when we used to look through magazines, every third page was an advertisement, mm -hmm. just like the web. Uh, the, we talk about recipes online, having to scroll through pages and pages of stories about how, uh, you know, someone has had this recipe with their friends. And, you know, honestly, that's kind of how magazines were too. Anyway, yeah. uh, I appreciate you for talking about the Hathi Trust because I had not known about that. Why, why was it separated out? Was, did it have something to do with the legal requirements? Well, it was, it was once Google had all this stuff, it was a way to make the efforts of the book search public uh, under this trust. Um, I don't know the full story, but I think, I think, um, uh, it was made, it, it was, I, well, I'll say it again. It was a way to make it more public. Um, uh, there was all the controversy and all the court cases, but this is a way that you can go to it. And the access is limited in the sense you can't download everything unless it's absolutely free of copyright. Um, if you have, if I had a certain university access, I'm trying to fight to get my old university access back. Uh, I could download whole publications, and it was and it was amazing for my. I'm doing research now on my Linotype book, and it's invaluable. The other thing you can get um, uh, in places is just while we're wonderful libraries, uh, because I'm a teacher in New York, I have a New York Public Library card, and it is amazing. I just did not realize this. Is there? There's a chapter of a book I need that they have there because they have everything there up to 50 pages, you can request a scan and a very nice librarian will manually scan it for you and send it to you in a PDF. Because oh. librarians are wonderful and they're saints. And you know these are the kind of resources, this is what we need as a society. Imagine if we had better access to quality information and history and, and studies and research, um, at least for those who go looking for it, we'd be better off. Yeah, yeah, especially if you didn't have to leave your house and go to the library and, and ask exactly. anybody, you just send an email, wow. I, some I, I've I've had uh, when I first moved into this place, um, I we were curious about who had lived here before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I was able to use um, you know public document stuff to find out a little bit more, and I was pleasantly surprised at how everything was available to me via 
you know, some sort of scanned in PDF. So I think there are ways to get to some of that information. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've, I hate that a lot of, um, there's a big part of the web. Well, no, there's a big part of history that is locked behind a very expensive uh, subscription service. And it is the part of history that is kind of the, uh, the, the country's newspaper database that you, I've only been able to get access when I took advantage of some Black Friday deal for um, Ancestry.com mm -hmm. because yep, they have yep, access yep. to all of those newspaper Newspapers. services. Yeah. yeah. And I, it really bugs me that all of that is behind a very, very, very expensive uh, subscription service because I found out about relatives and, um, you know, stories uh, for you know, weddings and all sorts of things of my, my ancestors and, you know, more recent ancestors, so to speak. Um, and I, it's to me, it's a little bit of a crime that that's all. So you know, locked you, away. It could be an employment opportunity for certain college students. Like I, I know that as a college student, I had access to a lot of very expensive databases. Mm. So um, people writing books and researchers would actually put out calls for college students to, oh. to bring their Lexus Nexus subscription and become oh, a wow. researcher for them. I mean, you you did the work. I mean, but you also like that was a cheap way for a relatively cheap way for them to get access. Were you paid? Do the scanning. Oh yeah. Oh okay. So you were paid, and you just happened to come with a uh, key to the kingdom, right? right. So you right. did the research, and you well, had the key well, to the kingdom. Yeah, it's it's like. Um, no, I don't even I don't even know if there's an analog in there. <laughs> that's just like there's a very kind of unique thing that. You pay someone who has access, but who also does the job. That's kind of cool. And I mean, I didn't do all of the, I mean, like basically right, they were right. like, find everything about this. And I'd be like, here are this, you know, 16 different or not six, here are the 600 different references to what you seem to be looking for. And they'd be like, get me this, 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 and this, you know, and then. It was you know, not it's fun. Funny because one time I was um, one time I was tweeting, and this was back in the day when tweeting was great. Um, when was that? I don't know, but it was. And I was talking about how because I used to have a subscription to the journal Sleep because I did a uh, sleep and, and um, a sleep science and dream podcast, and so Ooh. I was big nerd into, I still am a big nerd into sleep science, but I don't have a subscription anymore because it was expensive. Um, and so I was talking about how, oh, darn it. One of the articles from the journal sleep is locked behind the, the padlock. Um, and I wish I could have access to this. And then a kind of distant friend of mine, uh, slacked me and one of the slacks that I've been was like, Hey, um, I work for a university. So here's that, uh, page. From, or here's that article from that journal. And I thought, ah, that's so cool. I want to yep. go work for a university now <laughs> just so I could read all of these journals. That is the reason why I am emeritus. That's why I care. Because that means that I am permanently associated with the university. I get an email address and I get library access. That's lovely. And you can do other things with that email address too, like discounts, education discounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get, I get the nice. Wall Street Journal cheap. Oh. Otherwise, I wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> All right. um we should take a break because this is how we pay for this um i want to tell you about one password we're bringing you this episode of this week in google uh do your i love this question because i already know the answer to it it's no but let me ask you anyway do your end users always work on company-owned devices and always work on it approved apps yeah, I didn't think so. So how do you go about keeping your company's data safe when it's sitting on all of those unmanaged apps and devices? How do you pull it off? Well, 1Password has an answer to this question. It's extended access management. That's the answer. 1Password extended access management helps you secure every sign-in for every app on every device because it solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. Imagine your company's security like the quad of a college campus. There are nice brick paths between the buildings. Those are the company-owned devices, the IT-approved apps, and managed employee identities. And then there are the paths that the people actually take. We sometimes call these elephant trails or desire paths. These are the shortcuts worn through the grass that are the actual straightest places from point A to point B. 
These are the unmanaged devices, the shadow IT apps, the non-employee identities, you know, like contractors that you hire. Most security tools, they only work on those happy brick paths living in this world of rainbows and unicorns, thinking everybody's going to follow those, well, the yellow brick road. But a lot of security problems take place on the shortcuts, on those little elephant trails. 1Password Extended Access Management is the first security solution that brings all of those unmanaged devices, all of those unmanaged apps, those identities under your control. It ensures that every user credential is strong and protected, every device is known and healthy, and every app is visible. It's security for the way we work today, and it's now generally available to companies with Okta and Microsoft Entra and it's currently in beta for Google Workspace customers. So check it out at onepassword.com slash twig. That's one P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D dot com slash twig. And we thank 1Password for sponsoring this week's episode of This Week in Google. All right, uh, we are back from the break, and that means it is time to carry on with our uh, topics here. And up next, let me see where we, I'm losing my place in show notes. Um, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, an AI story. Um, given where things stand in terms of uh, self-driving vehicles, and we have seen companies kind of shifting focus between two places. One is the focus of trying to uh, put cars out on the road that drive themselves around, right? And we've seen that with uh, Waymo. We've seen that with um, some some actual, you know, large uh, car manufacturers. But then we've seen a shift for some, I believe Amazon being one of them, to vehicles that are like semi-trucks that drive themselves. And what's fascinating to me about this is it seemed like originally the focus was going to be on replacing uh, human-driven semi-trucks with these autonomous semi-trucks. And then the shift, the, the, the focus quickly shifted from that to an to an idea that you could call up a car like you can with Uber, like you can with Lyft, except it wouldn't be driven by a person. It would just drive itself and you could get from point A to point B. And I wanted to talk to you about that shift because with no pun intended, obviously, because I, I think that something that's unique about this show uh, too, is the fact that um, the sort of, underlying factors, uh, particularly sort of political underlying factors, always play a role in the conversations. And I think that, I wonder how much lobbying played a role in that shift. Um, there's an ingrained group, uh, interest group, when it comes to our nation's um, semi-truck drivers, our nation's uh, uh, sort of people who get things from point A to point B. Whereas the sort of gig economy that cropped up over time with, um, with Uber, with Lyft, is a much newer field that isn't quite dug in as much. And that is where I'm kind of curious if you feel like that has played any role in that sudden shift from semi-trucks that drive with themselves around to something where the the ground is a little bit looser and there's more place to kind of get your roots in uh, versus something that's so steadfast and true and has been for some time. Um, or am I just overthinking things? Stacy? I don't know if I agree with your core premise that there okay. has been the shift between um, individual transport, it sounds like, like individuals, uh, AI for individual vehicles and AI for mm -hmm truck riders are mass like distribution transport. So AI for mobility versus distribution maybe is a way to, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, and maybe it's because I've covered enough, like there's a Swedish company called Einride who does uh, trucks. They're actually just like a few weeks ago had actually sent out a letter to their investors saying like, 
hey, we need some more money. Um, so <laughs> I think we hear more about the consumer side of it because we are consumers and that's what we care mm -hmm. most about, right? Like mm -hmm. few consumers really think a lot about like the flow of goods to their their homes and stuff. Right. I also think America is a terrible place for testing out AI like distribution because it's so big and you have to travel across so many different legal zones like via I mean there there's federal there's the federal states but but when we're talking about autonomous vehicles they do have to drive through cities and I'm not sure how that would work. So that's another kind of maybe we don't hear about as much here. I, I, so, so I don't know if I'm answering any of your no, questions. No, 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 that's fair because it, I, yeah, I see what you're saying in terms of maybe I just wasn't, I, I didn't go deep enough to see that there was still a maintained focus on autonomous vehicles. And I think that you're right. I think it took more consumer facing uh, publications talking about autonomous trucks again, semi trucks again, for me to feel like the focus was coming back to that. Whereas it sounds like you're saying it's, it's been going on. It's just not something that we see because we're not part of that. We're not paying as much attention to that industry. Um, and it's not happening as much here. So in Europe mm -hmm. and in the most successful efforts have been around like the way that it has been happening of late, like, in the last five or so years, maybe even 10, I don't know, is you have like a distribution hub and you send things out in a pretty predefined route. So it's a, it's a predefined AI route with your trucks going this way. Um, they're usually not, a lot of them are electric because they're killing two birds with one stone, I guess. And so they're not hugely long distances. Mm. I don't know. Are we seeing a lot of autonomous driving that isn't electric? That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Well, are we seeing all. any? I don't think we're seeing any. It's not electric. It's interesting. Yeah, it doesn't so, need to be, but yeah. So that that's another area where you're like, okay, you know, you've got to recharge these things. And so it, in figuring out long-term distribution is harder and more challenging. I do think we'll get there because of the lack of people who want to take on those jobs today. Um, but I think it will require our, our American transportation infrastructure is not optimized for that. Europe's is probably better. I know in Saudi Arabia, they're doing a lot with that, but. So I put a story in the rundown in the story. It was, it was PR from Waymo mm -hmm. where they said that they've, they've driven 22 million miles now and they have their accident report. Stacy's here, so maybe she can do the math that I could not figure out. I could not get my little old head around it because <clears throat> uh, it, it requires a if uh, an algorithm, like a formula, Stacy. So they say how much, the, uh, for whatever methodology, they compare their um, safety record versus human driving over some miles. Now, how they exactly do that, I don't know. But if you scroll down a bit, so it's, it's 5.9 million miles in San Francisco, 15.9 million miles in Phoenix. If you keep going a little lower, there, thank you, right there. Fewer injury-causing crashes by 73%. The only hard number we get is 46 fewer. So, Stacey, does that tell us how many accidents they actually have? Um. So they're comparing this to a human drive, like a single yes. human driver or all human drivers? Human Are drivers. They Compared the to a human below. driver over the same 22 million mile distance in Phoenix and San Francisco, the Waymo driver had 73% fewer injury causing crashes. 42 mile, not 22 million miles, just to clear. Oh um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I don't I'm, know how much it is. Now they're trying to argue, that they're, they're putting this forward that makes them look good. I mean, but, but my point is, well, how many accidents are there actually? Are, are those accidents ones that we consider, is that what we tolerate? Is that okay? Kind of what's the deal here? And I've long been, Waymo at least is, I think, more regulated than, pardon me, Stacy, your Tesla owner your, or, 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 or manufacturer who uh, I've had this rant before puts out allegedly self-driving cars without full regulation, without full testing, 
without really understanding the safety and efficacy, without reporting back data in, a, in an accountable way. That's what bothers me. We're sending this stuff out in the road, and it may in fact be safer. It may in fact be better, but for God's sakes, we should know more about it and have some appro approval and accountability processes around this. But that's a lot of, you know, in four cities, that's a lot of miles. Um, you know, one lady famously got dragged under a car by GM's equivalent. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't feel as if our regulators are, I wish they'd pay more attention to this than some of the other stuff they have to pay attention to. So some things to think about here, and, and I'm not going to dig on, drag on this report exactly, but this table shows how many fewer crashes Waymo had compared to human drivers, um, regardless of who was at fault. So Waymos tend to drive conservatively. I've, I've been around them in Phoenix and they're annoying as anything. Um, so it's possible that that is a, like that may benefit them, right? They're, they, they're very yeah. conservative. They stop when they, they probably shouldn't and, and mm -hmm. people have to adapt to them. Is this compared to, so they, they, ca they call it a human driver, but they're also calling it human benchmarks. And I think it's also worth pointing out that Waymo is the Waymo self-driving algorithm is one thing and human benchmarks are all of us. And some of us are drunk and some of us are good. Mm -hmm. And some of us are terrible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, I do think that's worth considering, you know, because the idea is like, Hey, if we let AI take over everything, we are eliminating all those drunk people. Right. We're also eliminating the good people and that's going to frustrate us, but you know, it's worth noting. So those are kind of the things that I'm like, that jump out at me as like a skeptic, right? That I'm like, oh, I would like a lot more information on this. Yes. Like yes. injury causing crashes, regardless of who's at fault. So, and part of this is also the interaction between the two. Like if you have, yes. like if everything was Waymo, I actually think it might be like zero injury causing crashes, mm -hmm. but then your ride time would probably mm -hmm. go down considerably, you know? cost per mile would go up. So I don't know. I watched a video the other day on the socials uh, where somebody was behind a Waymo and the light, the traffic light ahead, the power was out. And so they're giggling on the video. I wonder what's going to happen. What's the Waymo going to do? So they stayed behind the car and I fast forwarded the video and it didn't know what to do. Yikes. It just stopped. To be fair, people don't always know what That's to do That's also true. That's true. But everybody else there was, had gone through. Everybody but the Waymo just sat there and said, I don't know. I don't know. That is what keeps me from ever. I have too much anxiety. And I just think about being in one of those when it does something wrong. And then I will feel entirely, entirely responsible for it, even though I know I'm not. But like, where is everybody going to place their frustrations on the person who hailed this self-driving vehicle in the first place? And then it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's not listening to the traffic signal director right now. And it's just doing what it wants to do. I have no control. I would just want to sort of slowly move yeah, down hide. in my chair. And <laughs> I'm not here because, oh, that would just give me, oh, I would hate that. I would hate that. That's what keeps me out of them. And that, well, that's not all. I don't have access to them anymore. But I had gotten before I left, um, I had applied to be part of the, um, you know, pilot program or whatever in San Francisco, just because I wanted to try it. And I did end up getting an invite while it was still invite only, um, and said, Oh, I'll make it into the city and do that at some point. And then I watched that video of a traffic signal director telling it what to do and not doing it. And the traffic guy going, you know, at the person in the car and the person in the car is like, I don't know, I'm not, I don't control the thing. I don't know. Um, but at the same time, I've also had, uh, two people, um, who live in the city who say they regularly take them and are very happy with them, um, and enjoy not having any social pressure to talk to the person there's in the car because there's one in the car to talk to right, right. and just being able to get work done while they wait to make their way to the trip. And yeah, you know, it's, we're only going to see on social media, the times when the thing goes wrong, 
compare that to all of the times when it goes right, and there are likely a lot more instances of it just making it from point A to point B, and maybe bothering the non-conservative driver, but if that's all that it's doing, I think it's okay. Um, but well, yeah, no, go ahead. There's technology available. So here's we're going to take a trip down, you know, wireless memory lane for a second. All the way back in like 2015, 2016, there was a government effort to do V to V, vehicle to vehicle communications. Right. Um, and then V to V, is it vehicle to infrastructure? I don't remember what the other one, but like having your traffic infrastructure talk to your car. Um, the automakers were actually kind of in favor of this. Uh, so it was Qualcomm because they were going to make a lot of money. Um, in like, I think it was 2017, the Trump administration threw all of that out. They were like, you know what? Let's not do this. So we still haven't come back to that. But there is a case to be like that if our infrastructure was upgraded, you're, you're very anxiety driven. Like that traffic light could have explained explained to the, the car what was happening. And it oh, would, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. It would communicate like, look, I'm out. Now, if the power's out, if your traffic light's malfunctioning because the power's out, which happens all the time on our, our little island, um, you know, there's not necessarily, like, I don't know what the details were around backup communication there. Um, but there is a case to be made that right now we're living in this messy, we're not even halfway there. We're like probably 20% of the way there in terms of automation. And we're hearing all the benefits of like 80% automation, but we're totally not there yet in terms mm -hmm. of like self-driving cars and this sort of thing. So I believe that eventually we will get most of the way there, but it's going to take a lot of money and time. And I don't know about any of y'all, but I remember being told like 10, 15 years ago that this was going to be happening by 2025. And I think a more realistic thing would probably be 2050. Oh. Dang it. I'm sorry. I know. I'm going to be like, but that's just in time for me to be so old. You, you that think I you got drive problems with that date. Think about yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. fair enough. Oh, dear. Yeah, Jeez. I'll be fine. I'm sorry. It's it's great. Yeah, it's you, not. You stop complaining, you whippersnappers. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. Um, yeah, but that would be super cool if the whenever you first said vehicle to vehicle, I thought, oh, no, now everybody could be mean to each other. Can you imagine you're in your car and then the speaker is like, why did you not take those steps? But that's not what it does. So I understand. Now. Man, your anxiety around driving is phenomenal. Michael. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my friend. <laughs> I just I feel like I do a good job and I don't want to. I'm a well, first of all, you haven't been here to know this, Stacey. But one thing that really caught me off guard was learning that Jeff is taller than I am. I'm a very tall person. And when I learned that Jeff was taller than I am, it still boggles the mind. But what I was going to say is <laughs> as a tall person, <laughs> as a tall person, I do not like to take up space because by default, I do take up space. And so I always like to be out of pathways and stuff like that. It's probably also the nature of my skin color as well. That plays a role in me trying not to take up space and be noticed because it happens by default. But anyway, um, what I'm, what I'm getting at is so in any instance where, uh, I am taking up more space than the part of my brain that thinks I should not is playing its role, then it, yeah, it drives my anxiety through the roof. So that's where being in one of these would be, be troublesome for me. But again, that's where I actually think the anxiety reduction would take place. If all the systems are communicating with each other, then I don't have to worry about it. And it's fine. I can let it go. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, folks, this is This Week in Google. Uh, I am Micah Sargent, subbing in for Leo Laporte this week. Uh, we have Jeff Jarvis, host emeritus and uh <laughs> all-around tall guy who knew uh <laughs> you know now paris is taller than you think too oh really how tall are all of y'all i'm six three. Oh. Six and four. yeah jeff's oh, six I'm, four i'm five eight how tall five eight and you? a half <laughs> five eight and a half and paris that's, is that's six, over seven. normal right no i'm kidding <laughs> i'm i'm above average yes <laughs> 
nice. normal. I didn't mean to say normal. I meant average. Sorry. Yeah. And of course, we have Stacy Higginbotham, Policy Fellow of Consumer Reports, who's here with us this week. Welcome back to the show. Former Twigger. Yes, indeed. Now, I am really excited to talk about this next, sto next story. I don't know, Jeff, if you put this in, but I loved coming across a little piece um, by Damon Barras, um, of who wrote about this in The Atlantic. Uh, Kermit the Frog oh. <laughs> and yes. artificial intelligence. So look, AI, you know, we people, depending on who you talk to, they see it as this tool that is just, you know, going it's gonna to destroy solve, humanity. It's going to destroy by humanity it's on gonna, one it's end. It's going to ruin the world. Yeah. Or on the other oh. end, it's going to save everything and save everyone and, and right, everything's right. going to be fixed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then some of us play around with it and we realize that it exists in a much smaller capacity of, of any of the, the things that we try to attribute to it. But sometimes it's just a delightful bit of amusement. And that yes. was the case uh, for Damon. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this, Jeff? So Damon was, uh, I, I forget it was, it was his kid. He was trying to just keep awake or something with his kid or yeah. with his kid or feed the kid or whatever. And so he had his phone and so he decided he'd use um, uh, AI to re replace everything on his phone's home screen with a Kermit the Frog themed um, icon. Yes. So, yes, basically um, used Bing Image Creator, which is in effect using OpenAI's Dolly. And uh, given that Damon has an iPhone, although I'm, I'm almost certain you can do this with Android as well, uh, you can replace the default icons for apps with a photo that you want um, through a little method with shortcuts. And so Damon was just sitting there and replaced every app icon on his home screen with images of Kermit. And they are so great because each one is like custom designed. So for example, the settings app has Kermit. That's the best one. Yeah. Yes. Holding a wrench and a screwdriver while smiling and looking at the camera. Um, the <laughs> authenticator app has Kermit the frog in police gear, holding a billy club. <laughs> um, signal. I love because signal of course is a way for you to kind of be anonymous or at least a little bit more, um, you've got encryption on both ends. And so it kind of gives the spy effect because you have Kermit the frog standing in front of what is some sort of light source. So it's a silhouette of Kermit the frog as he's kind of, it almost looks like he's whispering into his phone. And it's, it's like the people who are on the, 60 minutes who don't want right. to be named. Yes, like, exactly. The anonymous yeah, people. Yeah. And then the Instagram one is also fantastic because you have, Kermit the Frog, um, wearing a bikini and a has very long sort of uh, flowing platinum blonde hair and sunglasses, and is holding up the phone, uh, taking a selfie. They're just so stinking delightful, and and they're less obnoxious or less. They're actually easier to see than those yes. Google ones to yes. distinguish between than the silly Google icons on my phone. Yes, isn't yeah? You're so right. The the Google icons all look so similar, and then also to be fair, the Apple Photos app and the Google Photos app are both very similar to the Slack app, which is similar to the Authenticator app. And so, trying to visually distinguish between the two is mm -hmm. much more difficult than using Kermit's help. Uh, my, my favorite is the Gmail, where Kermit is happily buried in in, in letters. <laughs> Just uh, a pile of letters. Yeah, it it, it, it humanizes or frogonizes the phone. <laughs> I you agree, know? and and it's just it's just wonderful. And, and and this is I love this. It's Sarah. I saw the story. I thought, oh, what this is, this is the Atlantic, which tends to have a lot of moral panic. And I saw this. I thought, oh, what are they going to complain about now with the phone? And it's just delightful. Someone had fun with it, and it, and, the, and the post went crazy because mm -hmm. people liked it. They wanted this. This is great. Yeah. It was. Uh, a moment where I said, the second I have a little bit of free time, I, I want to do something like this now because it's just so fun. So and Damon Barris's post is 10.4 million views right now. Wow. Which character would you use, Micah? What would you want your icon theme that to be? That is a good question. Be, if, if it's, if it's got to be a Muppet, um, 
I would probably choose. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear Stacy's too. Yeah, I right. would choose Big Bird. Um, if it's a Just Muppet. because this is the tall uh, self-image thing. Well, it's it's actually because Big Bird's second. I love Kermit because Kermit's green, which is my favorite color, but I can't do the same. So right, I would right, choose right. Big Bird because Big Bird comes in second for me. Yeah, Stacy, Stacey, who would yours be? <laughs> my favorite Muppet is, well, are we, so it's like my favorite Muppet is actually, so Sesame Street Muppets, they're all Jim Henson. So I don't know how, how, how to oh, yeah, find you can, go. You can go so, full Jim Henson. I, I okay. allow it. <laughs> I can even include Fraggle <laughs> Rock in there. Yes. Um, I, I would go with either Oscar the Grouch or Grover. Those are my oh. those are my two faves. I'm I'm surprised, Stacey. I'm glad you left mine for me to have, since we have to have our own unique ones. But I Sattler thought, and Waldorf? Uh nope. No, always hate oh. that. Stacey. Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I'm so sorry. many old jokes today. I would have no, thought No, it's the, the crankiness. The Waffle Queen. I would have thought you would have picked Cookie Monster. Oh, Cookie Monster. No, cookie is like pure id, man. I'm way too rational for that. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't choose Sam the Eagle, Jeff. I really Wait, like Did Sam you the choose Eagle. Cookie Monster? Is that I who did. You would I choose? chose Cookie Monster. Oh, okay. I want cookie Monster, yeah. Um, okay. No. Cookie Cookie. <laughs> I also uh I really like the count, but I don't I feel like the count is pretty similar in looks to Kermit. Like it's still that same sort of cone face. That beakiness. And, yeah, the beakiness. So uh anyway. If we go back a few years, somebody would be suing somebody for for trademark violation. But the good thing is I think everybody will look at this now and say, that's cute, that's fine. I mean, obviously Sesame Street is not as awful as Disney. Right. Um, yeah. Do you notice that it wasn't a frozen character? I You're don't right. know the names of any of them, but I think Olaf is the the snowman. Yeah, sure. Olaf or Elsa or Anna or I know Kristoff. Sven. Oh, Sven would be oh, nice. Oh boy, that's which one is Sven to you? But the Muppets are owned He's, by the Disney Com- Corporation. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. Is, are, are they, they really? Not? Yes. That's right. Sesame Street is now also has uh, HBO has rights. They have rights to the yes, but the Sesame Muppets Street, themselves right. are on Disney Plus. Oh, it's just it's just ugh. it's all Disney. All the Disney way down. Disney my left kidney, and they're going to come take it when I stop paying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm like all right, sure. Sorry, Micah. <laughs> it's been real. Oh, yeah, it's been real. But actually, you have another good. kidney. It's fine. Yeah, we're good. We're good. I don't don't tell Disney that. I'd like to have both. Anyway. Um, Let's talk about uh, this other story that you've included before maybe we move from AI, uh, the fix for AI generated essays, because um, I remember, I don't remember if we had an opportunity to talk about it on this show, but I did talk about uh, a piece that had to do with um, companies who had hired writers Okay. Uh, they hired, it's like a freelance organization and they had hired writers to write stories and they were using tools to detect if any of the stories that the writer submitted were AI generated. And what would happen or what had happened in several cases was the tool came back with a claim that there was AI writing involved in the work that they had did they had done. And these were writers who had worked with these companies for more than a year at the very least, and in some cases, several years, who were immediately fired because they had used AI, quote unquote, to write their pieces. Um, a couple of those writers were interviewed for the piece and said, absolutely not. Was any of this written by AI? I would not use AI to write my stories. I've been working for this organization for a long time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it had come to find out the people who were in charge of sort of intake of these stories were using those tools like written by a human tools and misunderstanding them uh, because the tool would come back and say 72% certainty that it was written by a human and 28% certainty that it was written by AI, but they would only see the percentages and they would think that it meant that it was 72% human written, 28% AI written. 
And so people were losing their jobs because they didn't understand how to use the tools. Because humans are stupid. <laughs> and so it was kind of an interesting take on AI wasn't causing AI in terms of AI writing the pieces wasn't causing the job loss. It was AI ingesting the right. AI that was causing yeah, the job loss. But really, right. it was just the humans who were stupid, causing it. Stupid people. Yeah. And so you uh, have this piece about uh, from Kelsey Piper uh, writing for Vox. There's a fix for AI generated essays. Why aren't we using it? So what interests me about this? Micah, was I don't know how these checking things work. So it's just a paragraph in the middle that that's what fascinated me about how watermarking works at this stage. So if I may, mm -hmm. instead of having the AI generate the next token according to a random selection, the watermarking has the AI use a non-random process, favoring the next tokens to get a high score in, in a scoring function. It might, for example, favor words with the letter V just slightly so that the text generated with this scoring rule will have 20% more Vs mm. than normal human text, though the actual scoring function is more complicated. And you wouldn't notice and blah, blah, blah. And so it's that's that sounds to me so tenuous. I mean, it's kind of ingenious in a way, but well, if, if, if the decision is being made on the basis of such as that, it's scary to be able to fight it then. Yeah, because what if my name is Victoria and yeah. as a child, uh, my parents got me a book that was filled with V words and pictures of those V items, violin. You constantly feel victorious. Victorious. Or you're vivacious. You <laughs> yes. To, and you like to vindicate yourself. Yes. And so I am <laughs> naturally prone to using the letter V uh, more often. And therefore, I you know, use V more than, but again, then that's just that one person who, if they got the job as the writer and this tool was used, then they'd be in trouble. My problem is just when, be it a teacher or a, uh, an education institution or a company just uses these tools and takes it as, as uh, gospel. That's where the problem exists. I think we have well, to talk to the human beings. Yeah. And the other issue is, and we saw this with search, once you advantage people for doing something, they will game the system because we are humans and creative mm. and as much of an algorithm and as much as we'd like to imagine that this is going to replace humans, it can't because we're sly and creative and we will always game things. So if you, if a student figures out, they'll, we will look for like ways like man, this is pegging all my stuff. Why might this be? Let me try this. And you'll, people, they may not consciously realize they're reducing their V words, but they are just like we trained the AI to play Go. We're, we're optimizing for a certain result, which is not to get caught doing as little work as possible, right? Or making mm -hmm. as much money as possible, whatever. I mean, this is literally why Google sucks now because we've gamed that system and we're- Humans again. Humans. <laughs> yeah, you can you cannot pit humans against algorithms, AI, robots. You just can't pit us against them at scale and let them go. You always have to come back and tweak it to deal with humans because we're smart and creative. I also have a question. Did the person who messed up the numbers and reading the numbers wrong, does that person still have a job? That is a good question. Huh. Um, that was not in that was not investigated in the article. Bet you uh, they do. But I bet they do. Um, because they were probably, yeah, they were probably far enough up the chain that it didn't didn't uh, affect them. Uh, we could also be better at math as humans. That's yeah. like, like I if mean, we like, didn't have shame-based education for math, I think that though that many humans would be better at math, but there's so much. Uh, you don't know how to do this and oh, come up and stand in front of everyone and get this problem wrong. And oh, you got that wrong for this. Uh, don't get me. Don't get me started. I just think okay. there's a lot of shame based teaching in math. Maybe it's changed since I was in uh, elementary, middle and high school, which wasn't that long ago, but um, maybe it's changed. The, the other thing that's happened, I just got off a call with a professor at university I'll probably be working with next and working on AI and education and, and, and language. Um, the attitude has changed considerably. The New York Times had a piece a week ago 
where the chancellor of the New York Public Schools, New York Public Schools, when ChatGPT came out, immediately banned it. No, 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 we cannot have this. Uh, well, now it's encouraged. They're encouraging the use of it. They're doing it especially for faculty, but also giving teachers the freedom to use it and figure out how to use it. It's a tool. The Modern Language Association, I think I mentioned this on the show, has guidelines uh, for this. And they say print was a tool and typewriters were tools and spell check's a tool and this is another tool. If we can figure out how to keep people from being stupid with their use of it, then there's some advantages. I remember when we weren't allowed to type out my essays in like middle school, we had to handwrite them. It was, it was considered cheating to type it out. Yeah. I showed Brito. I was in my freshman year in college, my con law course, and the final was a blue book exam, right? You had to do it in class itself. I showed him sa the professor samples of my handwriting. And I said, you don't want this. <laughs> I'll write it out in class. I'll give you the blue book. You can check against it, but I'm going back to type it. And he said, thank you. Wow. Uh, Stacy, was there more you wanted to say about math education? I I felt like I interrupted you there. I apologize. Oh no no no! I I've been I've been jumping all over you, Micah. I'm so sorry. But no, no okay. math education. We should um, have more of it. Yes, I agree. I I think it would be it would be good. Um, wait, wait wait wait! Quick question: Who here, you Benito included, who here was good at math? I was. I'm oh, good I figured. At, I figured. I'm not actually good at the calculation i'm good at understanding what's behind it and then i would make stupid errors because i'm a little uh -huh. adhd but i get that math. makes sense i, I can see you being that way Mike, i had a really good math teacher um but i just was yeah i was not i think i didn't practice enough um and so i could get the i i felt like i could get the concepts in the moment and then when the tests came around, it was much more difficult. And I did fine, but I didn't do as well as was to my standard and as well as I did in so many of the other areas. And so, yeah, math was always my weakest subject. Um, but that is in spite of the fact that the teaching was, I feel, exceptional. It was not shame-based teaching. I, I'm That passion that you may have heard came from some of my siblings experiencing some pretty bad teachers, I think more mm -hmm. than anything else when it came to math specifically. Um, and from other horror stories that I've heard uh, from people who were shamed into not wanting to take, you know, the chance of, 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 you know, uh, en engaging in the class to try to get right. somewhere. Yeah. What were you good at math? Uh, I think in the beginning was, but then we moved around and I kind of lost my, my train with it. And then I, I wasn't. I'm there's thankful clear... that computers do a lot of that for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a clear delineation at a certain level that kids become bad at math. Mm -hmm. um, it's different for girls and boys, but yep. there, is, there is a clear dividing line. And as a journalist, I'm like for a journalist, I'm excellent at math. I actually got my first job because I knew the formula for percent change. And that was. <laughs> yes. Awesome. And it sounds silly, but nope, that's rare. That's awesome. In my newsroom, I actually had to write out the formula for literally everybody on. This was before that we had actual Rolodexes. So I wrote it out on the Rolodex under percent change and I stuck it in there and they still would come to me. They'd be like, Could you? I'm like oh my God, <laughs> new minus old over. Oh, come on. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Um, all right, let's see. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Actually, oh, we'll take a little uh, pause that refreshes here. Um, we are currently uh, recording an episode of This Week in Google. Uh, I am Micah Sargent subbing in for Leo Laporte, who will be back soon. Um, but Ooh. I am joined by the wonderful Jeff Jarvis and Stacey Higginbotham. Here. You used the word wonderful. I thought you were going to go to Stacey. Uh, you're both wonderful. wonderful. Stacy's wonderful. I think you're both pretty I'm grumpy. Cool. Um, you know, grumpy people are still wonderful. I have grandparents. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, <the> next, <laughs> the next age joke. Jeez. <laughs> oh, um, wow. Anyway, so Stacy, I want to. I you'll have to stop me if if this is a, maybe i don't see how this could be like any conflict of interest at all because it's uh, it's a praising of the organization um for which you are a part and it is uh consumer reports permission slip 
app. I don't know how much you are involved in that or know about that, but um, it is, for folks who don't know, a wonderful app that everybody should get. Um, and what it does, especially, this is where I have to stop and get frustrated for a moment. I moved out of California, and there were a few things that were kind of frustrating about leaving California. One of those things, I won't go into all the rest of them, one of those things is suddenly not having the uh, consumer, Cal the California consumer now I'm see I'm in my thesaurus again. Yes, yeah, CCPA. Thank you, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. Ching, um, as protection, and immediately, you know, when I'm I'm having to sign up for new services and whatnot online, I'm realizing that I don't have that anymore, and I can't do the do not sell your information stuff as easily as I used to. But all of that. Um, made me even more grateful for the permission slip app, which is a way to, in some cases, automatically have consumer reports on your behalf, um, reach out to companies and say, hey, I don't want you keeping my data. Or in some cases, just saying, hey, tell me what data you have on me. Um, there are loads of different options for setting it up exactly how you want it. And what I love is that it's always following up with me to let me know we automatically submitted the request to have your data removed from this place. Uh, we just added some new companies to the list. I get emails all the time from these companies saying, hey, we got that request for you to um, see what data we have on you. Here's that email that you can click on the link to, to learn about what data is there. And I go and I think, oh my goodness. Wow. How did the Home Depot have all of this information on me and why? Uh, the Home Depot, for some reason, is like really bad <laughs> about having a bunch of data um, of all places. And so I just wanted to sing the praises of Permission Slip because it's entirely free, which is wild, and it's pretty incredible. Well, thank you. I did not work on it at all, but <laughs> I work. I work half the time with the team that the innovation lab. And we have some really cool stuff. Like we're preparing something called ask CR, which is our going to be our AI agent um, that we are developing in house where you can do things like, Hey, I have this brand of fridge and there's some weird, it's making a weird chunking noise. And it'll be like, Oh, here's what we have from the product manual. Have you checked this, this, or this? Oh, it looks like you're still under warranty for this. Do you want us to start like a customer cool. service call? So we're working on some really cool things. Um, and yeah, yeah, I see it. And I just think that it's amazing that this is just being offered to us for, for free. And, you know, this is where I will say, Hey, maybe, uh, it's worth making a donation to these organizations. Yes. Yeah, so I was like, please make a donation because like, there's a lot of things that are happening that are good for everyone, but, and, you know, we'll see. Yeah. So speaking of consumer reports, you <laughs> recently did something, baby? yes, that is near and dear to my heart. And I'm really you excited about, about it. So yes. Woo. Tell us all about it. Okay. So anybody who has witnessed me on the show from way back in the day knows that I am crazy about the smart home and I have dozens upon dozens of devices over the years that have failed me for various reasons. And we actually have a big push for ending software obsolescence. So this idea that you have a connected device and any sort of connected device, it could be your car, your washing machine, your $30 smart plug, garage and door opener. Idea, your garage door opener. And the idea is that once you buy that, what are your rights as a consumer, as like an owner? Because Right now, as it stands, you really don't have them. And we hear horror stories all the time about a company like going out of business and bricking it. Or maybe like, remember the Revolve Hub? Revolve got bought by Google and Google was like, okay, we're going to shut this down. And people were like, but I just spent $300 on this thing. Do not shut it down. Uh, we saw it actually recently with Spotify. They shut down their smart thing. Uh, so there's the bricking. Then there's also like taking back features. So mm -hmm. maybe you paid for a physical device that like your car and it had heated seats. And then one day BMW is like, you know what? You really want those heated seats? We're going to charge you for them. Mm -hmm. Have a subscription. Or finally, changing your ability to resell the product. So like big, two big stories actually just in the last few months was the 
the snoo bassinet by the happiest baby. They changed, like, if you sell that now, you're not selling it. The, your new buyer, if you resell that $1,600 bassinet, has to pay for a subscription to get the same features you used to have. The oh. other example is, yeah. The, uh, and the other example is Peloton, which just added a $95 activation fee. If you resell the Peloton to someone and they want to start paying Peloton money for a subscription. Oh, like, this is actually is so annoying, <laughs> isn't it? So we looked at all of these things. We decided to call it software tethering, which is the, it's actually Ooh. Jonathan Zittrain. We took it from him in this idea that because connected devices have this unique link back to the manufacturer, um, because they have software embedded in the device and your device has to talk back to their cloud, that they have this tether that allows them to control your ownership rights to the product. And as you can imagine, that doesn't always bode well for consumers. So we called on the FTC to, to basically create some clear guidelines around that. And we, we asked them to, to kind of do five things. One is do a, am I talking too long? I'm talking so long. Not at all. Wanna, no, heavens no. <laughs> No, like, no, no. Do you want to ask me some questions about this before I go into my monologue? Um, okay. So we wanted them to do first big thing, and this is important for everyone. Set a minimum guaranteed time frame for how long you as the company plan to support the product. And like, if you are building a car, tell me that you're only going to budget and allocate resources for 10 years to support my car, right? Mm -hmm. So I know exactly how long this is going to work. Because right now, like I have a 2013 Tesla that I'm driving around in and any day it could just die. <laughs> I have no faith that that my car is going to keep working. And I would love to know that. Um, so that's one. Two, uh, promote, uh, sorry, Make sure any feature that is in the device that is important or core to the device works without internet connectivity and the software. So your mm -hmm. ovens should still preheat and heat ah. and turn on. Your car should still drive and presumably had air conditioning. And yes, you may lose some like super awesome features, but if we can talk about like what that, how that could get legislated. But three uh, is protect adversarial interoperability. Oh, I don't know if that's actually three or if that's four, but that's one of our five things. And that's the idea that if you go out of business or lose access to the software, people can come in and adapt it so the product still works for them. Um, five is, or sorry, four is, I don't remember right now. Do you have it up, Micah? Um, we did have it up just moments ago. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what five is and we'll come back to four. Yes. Five is my favorite because it's asking for the FTC to create this concept of longevity by design in building products, Ooh. even software-based products that will last over time. It's kind of like CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Something Administration. I think it's Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Administration. Probably. They yeah. have secure by design. And we're actually formulating right now, like this is literally what I'm doing in my, my spare time, what it will take to build a connected product that lasts over time, even if like a company goes out of business, what are the, what are the parameters of doing that and making that real? Um, and then hopefully the FTC will encourage people to have that. Oh, and Mike has given me the answer. Encourage tools and methods that enable reuse if software support ends. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. I, I like this one too. It's, a, it's This is basically like if you're, I don't know, maybe not your oven, but <laughs> if your smartphone, if if it does get bricked, maybe I could sideload some software to make it work as like a video camera. Or if something else breaks, how can I reuse the hardware so it doesn't end up as e-waste? Was it Samsung oh. that um, did that a little bit? It was either Samsung or Google, but it I remember- was Samsung. So yeah. Samsung had a recycling program that they talked up and then they did absolutely nothing with. Dang it. Because they were supposed to I make, know. you could turn it into a baby monitor or you could make it into a little uh, 
probably a, a digital camera kind of thing. And I thought that was such a great idea. And I think too about the Pebble smartwatch, how um, I think it was mm -hmm. iFixit and some and a different third party that worked together to create firmware and software for the original Pebble smartwatch so that you could continue to use it. Yes. And you still can actually use your Pebble today. So that's like actually a good example. The success. Samsung, yeah, they actually did that. Um, yeah. And again, that's a little less like some of these are for more of the nerdy people like adversarial interoperability and tools and methods to enable reuse. Those are going to be for mm. like the super geeky people who kept their little printer working. Right. But these other things are for normal people who don't want to like sideload something or flash firmware over to a device and then you right, know, right. like <laughs> I have it's, it's, it's like re repair it yourself stuff. Oh, okay, if you have a laboratory and laboratory coat and 45 <laughs> tools you can you can got to have the lab coat. Yeah. It's actually important for electrostatic discharge to have the lab coat. <laughs> um I I have a I've it, it bums me out. Um, because a long time ago, uh, there was this cool company, of course, they love to say we're former Apple engineers and they were, uh, and they made a, this was back before, uh, the, I think it was Nitza who said that every car manufactured after the state needs to have a backup camera. So this was still in the time where backup cameras were less common and they made this incredible backup camera that was a license plate frame and it had a solar panel along the bottom and then two cameras up top on top of the lightning pl license plate frame and then there was an obd2 thing that you plugged in and it created a local wi-fi network in your car and then you connected to it through the app and then you could use it as a backup camera with your phone brilliant idea the company went out of business and when it did it we lost server side access to the technology that made it possible to like reset and set up the device again. Mm -hmm. And so from that point on, I wasn't able to use it. I kept it for ages because I hoped that either one day I would suddenly become some sort of electrical engineer who could figure <laughs> out how to repurpose it or that, you know, somebody would think of some way to sideload it or something. And it just didn't happen. Um, and knowing this was possible would be very cool. Do you remember, Stacey, that story about the person who um, called in, I think it was maybe even my cue. It may have been another garage door opener, but whatever garage door opener it was, the person called in to support and they said, I, look, I'll admit it. I did not show up as my best self during that call. I was rude to the person. And um, they tried <laughs> they tried then to access their garage door the next day and they couldn't get in and it turned out that the support person had bricked their garage door <laughs> remotely because of the horrible exchange that had taken place and in that moment it was like a kind of a deserved situation but it's still a no, bummer that, that like that's possible and that actually happened like i think this year either this year or last year there was actually a gentleman who an Amazon delivery driver thought that they heard him say something racist from his video doorbell and re told Amazon about it. And Amazon shut off his ring cameras, his Am Amazon Madam A devices, Echo devices. Whoa, for that's a full chilling. Week while they investigated the claims. And he was like, and it turns out he did not say anything racist. The No one in his house was home. And I guess his Eufy doorbell had an automated response that the guy misheard. Uh. But like, yeah, that is that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, Owl Cam. Stacey, um, can I ask you about? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go on. Um, so I see you, you, this letter that you sent. Um, <laughs> it has the background, it has recommendations, and it also has uh, gathering others to the cause because there are many, many signatories to it. As this goes, so I presume this is kind of the first talking of this. As this goes forward, I, I got involved in policy when around uh, uh, legislation around the newspaper industry and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm new to all this. And, and I watched how lobbyists write full legislation. Does there come a point in this process when you propose a, a written version of regs or statutes uh, from your perspective? So this is... This is a good question, and I'm not like a super genius when it comes to policy. Strategery, strategery is hard for me. Um, so what, what I am doing is I am writing 
a longevity by design document to give to the FTC to influence hopefully their thinking. I will also be sharing it with everybody. And I'm talking to people within the industry because like there are real technical issues at play in terms of designing a product that is software connected to last forever, right? You've got it not forever, but for the physical life of the product or close to that. Um, we went to the FTC because writing rules about writing like a law and getting Congress to pass a law around this is hard. Hard. And there's, <laughs> well, it's not just that it's hard, but also the FTC has theoretically in an ideal world, it has more flexibility. It has the investigatory resources to actually implement something in this. You could argue that all of these come under fair and deceptive or unfair, deceptive, unfair and deceptive trade practices, which is mm -hmm. one of the things the FTC looks at. Um, I mean, to me, the core issue for anybody who's buying some sort of connected device is right now you're buying like a hope. You're mm -hmm. hoping you have no sense of how long, like how long, I'll just ask each of you, how long does a video doorbell last? What is the lifespan of a video doorbell? What do you think? I, uh, five years. Five years. All right, Jeff. No idea. Don't have okay. one. I would have said three years. Amazon actually does list how long it plans to give security updates to their their products, so you can actually find out how long it planned. I think Amazon. It's between three and four years. So, mm -hmm. Micah, Micah, Oof, you're wrong. See, there's that hope that I was buying. I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I thought but, five but years. See, that's like we can't. And and actually, just like a week and a half ago. Samsung said they were going to support their Tizen-based smart TVs for seven years. That's great. Now, when you buy a Samsung TV, you're basically buying something that you can count on for seven years to get feature updates and security updates, right? So now you know. Awesome. They don't actually do that for any of their appliances. So when you buy a Samsung smart fridge, is it seven years? Consumer Reports Research says that the average consumer expects a fridge or a large appliance to last between 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. I can almost guarantee you Samsung's not releasing software updates for that long. Yeah. But we don't know. Yeah. Right. That actually, speaking of that, when moved into this place, the um, the washing machine has some quote unquote smart features. Um, they're a little silly. Uh, it's not, it's not like a full Wi-Fi connected thing. It's uh Hey, if there's an error, you can hold your phone up while the app is open and it'll read the NFC tag that will have a special error code. And then you can kind of, and, um, I was kind of looking into it and the app that was supposed to do that is isn't even updated anymore. So it's like, yeah, I, I've actually been especially mindful of that when I'm making purchases, there's, um, you probably, uh, saw that brilliant the company that makes the mm -hmm. like on wall panels was scooped up by um another company and or i think it might have even been two strategic investors but regardless um apparently they're going to be staying around for a while but they're pivoting to builders to the builder market to the mm -hmm. uh kind of that that side of 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 uh, smart home and I told them they should do that when they launched. Oh, did you really? <laughs> I I think it's a great idea, but it also bums me out as someone who thought that the brilliant was brilliant and that the brilliant panel was, was such a great idea. And then again, you're buying into this, this thing that may not be around for as long as you're expecting it to. And especially when it comes to stuff that you are installing in your walls, to me, for some reason, that carries a psychological weight of this is going to be around for a while versus something that maybe you hang on your wall or you just plug in and sit on your desk. It feels like it should last longer and continue to operate longer, even if that's just some weird you know, idea that I have. And so I love that you're saying, FTC, let's, let's do something about this. Let's, let's fix this. Because yeah, what, what about the, it was a white hub and um, you plugged it into your router and it, they basically tried to charge a bunch of money with, for a subscription service for people who had bought the device at $129 and it worked fine. And then 
they were like, actually, that thing that you've already paid for, you're going to have to start paying a subscription to access. And then they quickly ran out of business. <laughs> but it's it's wild that they were able to do that. And yeah, I agree. They shouldn't be able to do that. It's not okay. And that stupid, stupid, stupid um, transfer fee for the Peloton is just, oh. that's well, you just know, wrong. Verizon used to try to charge you if you bought a new phone. Verizon would be like, oh, we're going to charge you five bucks or 10 bucks to, to change to a new phone. And I'm like, you MFers, that is not okay. I'm still on your freaking yeah, service. I'm still with you don't you. have to do anything. I'm I'm re- I'm physically putting in a SIM card. That is literally all that's happening. None of the oh, like none of the billing information is changing. But they were like, "Yeah, we're going to charge you ten dollars." Well, because you see, we kids, I'm old enough to know the only way you could get a phone was to rent it from Ma Bell, and you were not allowed to attach anything else to the wires. So we're better. Wow. Than that. Oh, are we about to talk about Carter phone? Is that about to come up? <laughs> Carter phone. Carter phone was the decision to allow things to attach. To oh, the wires. Uh, okay. So it's not coming up. It, I brought it. I up. guess it's oh, not. No. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Carter phone. That's that was the uh, name of the like suit. Uh, yeah. If you if you Wikipedia, you'll see. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, Carter phone. It it comes up in my life a lot because I write about tel- or I used to write about telcos. Are you enjoying uh, policy? I miss being a journalist. I like being in polit like not in politics, but you know, I like mm-hmm. doing this and it does feel very purposeful, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a little prickly and I think I'm a better journalist ah, than a policy ah. person. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm a little prickly. Um, um, all right. I think that means that we will get down to the end of the show. Here. That's because he doesn't want to get too close to the prickly line. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> okay. Having been warned, <laughs> having been warned about prickly. No, no, no. Um, I just am noticing that we are uh, approaching the end of the hour. And so it's a, it's a perfect time uh, to head there. This of course is this week in Google, uh, the show hosted or paneled this week by Stacy Higginbotham, Jeff Jarvis, and Micah Sargent, as Leo Laporte is out and about. Um, at the end of the show, there are picks. Uh, I did not prepare a pick because I forgot about that part of the show. <laughs> but Jeff, can you kick us off with your stuff? <laughs> um, there's so many choices. I can share them. Uh, Stacy, do you have one? You can do that book review if you want to. Oh, I, well, I was actually going to show you a little okay. trick. I have an Ooh. actual tip or trick. Oh, nice. Good. Okay. All right. Well, I know. why don't you go ahead and then I'll pick one. Oh, okay. I, don't, um, I didn't mean to violate Micah's. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Management here. Stepping yeah, but, on my toes. No, it's fine. Just, it's fine. I just wanted to. Stacy, I would love since, it if you went first. Since I'm the only one who's prepared. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm over prepared, Stacy. He's got, he's got a lot. I'm prepared. It's, it's special for me. Normally, I was always like, Leah would uh, turn to me and he'd be like, and Stacy, and I'd be like, oh crap, oh, what do I have? <laughs> um, okay. So this is just something, I don't know if y'all know this, but I snore. Like I am a, not a delicate lady and I snore. So I've been trying to track that. And I discovered that Google, if you you guys are not aware of this, on your Pixel phone, if you plug it in, you can actually set it up to track your snoring under the digital wellness section. So they have this whole Ooh. section on your pixel on, called digital wellness. And if you go there, uh, you can turn on bedtime mode. <laughs> that sounds like it's going to tell you a story. And when you go to bedtime mode, it will, you turn it. I have mindset to turn on while charging after 10 PM and before 7 AM, which is good enough for me, but you, you can customize it or you can use a schedule. Um, it sets up, do not disturb all these things. And it also, if I give it permission, will track my coughing and snoring during the night. And then it takes a lot of clicks to get here every day, but it's kind of nice because sometimes my husband's like, oh, you snored so much. And I'm like, sir, Prove I it. only snored for 32 minutes last <laughs> night. 32 whole minutes though? <laughs> the whole time? But they were the wrong minutes because apparently uh-huh. he was awake, right? So like, I get it. But, I know like, I did of, a snore last night because I quite I can still remember 
the feeling of a foot kicking me uh, and jostling me from sleep. And I woke up facing the ceiling and that's how I know I was snoring because I had rolled to my side and then I, I usually don't snore because I'm a, I'm a, I try to be a side sleeper, but sometimes I end up on my back. But yes, I distinctly remember last night. Thank you for the reminder. So now I can go razz uh, my partner about that. <laughs> but yeah, I must have been snoring last night. <laughs> Yeah. So if you, if you want like evidence, like of how bad or not, I mean, like, man, if I've had a few drinks or I take like a muscle relaxer, cause I've had a migraine or something, man, it's like five hours. And I'm like, Whoa, that is a lot of snoring. I'm yeah. probably like dying, but yeah. So that's my, my trick. It's, it's free. It's on your pixel. If you have a pixel, if you don't, then this is absolutely useless to you. And <laughs> this is this week in Google. <laughs> Okay, Jeff, it is your turn. So now. it is my turn. I'm, I just want—I want to make sure because we talked about this before we got on the air. I just want to make mention of this for Stacy's fans that I found. I was very proud to find Stacy Bait, a book review about when a smart house turns evil. So I'm hoping this will be on Stacy's book club at some point, just because it's too perfect. Uh, but that's not my pick. Um, uh, I've got well, you got to tell us wait, the name of the, the name book of the really book? fast. Oh, yeah, well, come got, on, man. I got to look it up then. Jeez. It's okay, cold. here. I, I had it. William, oh, an intelligent William. robot, begins to lead its feckless creator to terrible places in the name of freedom. Freedom for whom? <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm not a horror fan anyway, so I would. And plus, I don't like, you know, dystopian AI stuff. I'm getting sick of that. But I thought it'd be fun for Stacy. All right. So. Um, I threw this in at the last minute, actually. Uh, I didn't know this. Somebody in the chat for AI Inside told me about this. <clears throat> Notebook LM, this is going to replace us all, folks. Notebook LM's audio overview feature. You can put stuff in a Notebook LM, and it can build various things, right? We know this. It can make an index. It can make a glossary. Well, now it can take the material and turn it into an uh, engaging audio discussion with two AI characters, i.e. a podcast. I saw this and I'm really interested in Notebook LM because I have so much data and notes and like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And it's great. And the idea though of doing this, I'm kind of like, I I'm totally going to try it out. Yeah, you got to try it. You got to try it. Oh, so when you open a notebook cool. and go to the high level guide, it lets you create a fact an FAQ, a table of contents, a briefing doc, and more. There will be a new generate button. Two AI hosts, air quotes, will have a lively, air quotes, back and forth discussion. They can summarize your added sources, make connections between topics, and bart banter. <laughs> hmm. That's okay. Some banter going on. I some think, witty I think banter. If, if they've downloaded uh, Twit uh, shows over the years, they'll probably banter about waffles and not understand why the machine is doing that <laughs> waffles and being old i feel like that's the consistent thing that we talk oh, about yes. it is i found that just absolutely interesting um and a joke for a podcast show uh, anything else? terrifying what if it what if it replaces us all exactly honestly exactly. more power to it yeah <laughs> mike is so done with this he's like no fine enough banter I'm I'm over bantered. Uh, oh. Stacy, are you still are you still carrying a a fold phone? No, no, I've got the eight, the Pixel okay. eight. So the, Huawei is coming up with a trifold phone. It's like the origami of phones. Come on, why? No, I the origami know. of phones would be like a little crane. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> crane um, phone. and then actually from my picks. I found this interesting. A guy, Story Maps is a wonderful application. You can make all kinds of great maps with it. Is mapping all of the ships that went down in World War II. More than 20,000 ships sank during World War II. And he's been going to get all the possible data that's available. And if you scroll up in this thing, um, it's, it's, it's just gobsmacking. Of course, when you see 20,000 ships and think of all the people who were on them uh, sunk in the war. Uh, but then all kinds of other interesting things that he added in. Axis versus allied colors, how many per year, uh, all kinds of fascinating things. So it's just data. Data are wonderful. And um, you might have fun. Uh, fun so many ships. Word. But yeah, isn't that amazing? 
And these are just the ones yeah. that are historically, like that we are aware of historically. They're, well, he they're not the secret spy ships. Yeah. Right. That, that, but yeah, he used, he wasn't just necessarily a known location. It was what was known about it from news reports or whatever data he could get. This is so much work. Yeah. This is incredible. It is. Isn't it? Wow. So Look at all of those ships. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the tool that I'm going to talk about this week is something that I learned again, it's always the case that, um, different experiences that you have require learning new things and moving is one of those things where you just come across new stuff. And Instagram was serving me up some new, um, accounts to check out because probably because of my purchases on Amazon, it figured out that I was, you know, buying different home stuff, I think is it's probably how this got on it. And so I started getting, uh, recommendations of different, home builders. And, uh, there was a property inspection, uh, property inspector for the Portland area. And so I've been watching a lot of his videos and he said that one of the most common causes of house fires that he comes across is, uh, because of what he calls the fart fan. Now the fart fan whoa, is, whoa, whoa. is the exhaust <laughs> B? It's the exhaust fan in the bathroom um, that people I use. have never heard it called that. I have never heard it called that either. And so Did I was see? really caught off guard but when I, he, but you I knew, knew exactly right? what it was. You yeah. When he said it, I was like, Oh, that's the fan in the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard it called that before. This is the first time, but anyway, the fan that, it's usually turn on if I take a shower and I'm trying to get rid of the, the steam. Yeah, that's why you turn on. I thought sure. you were going to use a different S word. <laughs> I was like, you take a shower, sure. <laughs> take a shower. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Oh, that's funny. Um, but Stacy's back. These, these fans, um, A, are not meant to be running for as long as people will turn them on and then they don't turn them off and they just keep running and then they overheat and then they catch fire. And then on top of that, when they're installed, people do that really poorly. And so sometimes there will be uh, wires sticking out of the edges of them. Sometimes they don't put the grommets on the holes where the wires go through. And so as the fan vibrates, it's slowly uh, vibrating against the sheath on the wire, which eventually cuts through the sheath, which touches the bare wire to the metal, yeah, which causes arcing, which causes a fire. Yes. So get those inspected first and foremost. But the other thing is um, what I'm recommending which you don't have to get this brand, but I just really trust this brand. Leviton um, makes a, and again, many brands do, a humidity sensor switch. And this is a device that you replace your fart fan switch with. And this will, it's got a hygrometer built into it. And it just turns on when it recognizes that there's a lot of humidity in the room. Does it presume then, that farts are humid? Uh, no, it does not oh. do anything for farts. This so. does not solve that problem. <laughs> it is not for that. Only the um, shower problem. Only the shower problem. Farts are humid, I would imagine. However, I'm not going to dignify that with a response. No. And so <laughs> you know why they're n okay. Sorry, I'm not going to go into <laughs> no, science. Stacey. Oh, no, you, no. you have to. So, okay. Stacy's science corner. <laughs> well, hold on. We can come back to Stacy's science corner, but I want to finish yes, here by ahead. saying Sorry. that. Purple. When the <laughs> humidity uh, gets to a certain point that it turns on, when it gets to a certain point, it turns off. You can also set it for timers and stuff like that. But now it's become something I'm very mindful of that I was not aware of before. And what Scooter X says, and I think this is a good uh, choice. Uh, Scooter says, I replaced the motor and the fan in the bathroom here when I moved in. It was a motor used in many oven vent fans. Um and it can be a good idea if the way that you test if a, an exhaust fan is working as it's supposed to is you turn on the fan and you take a tissue, like, uh, I mean, the ones that you put to your nose, not a paper towel or not toilet paper, but a tissue because they're thin enough. A and Kleenex. A Kleenex. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> there's the proprietary eponym. And you put it up against the fan. And if it stays then your exhaust fan is working as it should. 
Um, if it falls, then you need to, at the very least, clean your exhaust fan, but you might need to check on if the motor needs oiling, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, have somebody, if you don't know how to do it, also check the wiring and make sure it's good to go. But there's that humidity sensor. Now, I don't know. Do you want to talk about why it's not humid or? <laughs> oh, no, I have to know. It's not why it's not humid. It's how you like, this is so, oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> When I'm on this show, it always ends with something it always inappropriate. Does. Yes, it always does. Okay. So <laughs> you know how when you're outside and it's cold and you can see your breath, and that's a function of the temperature outside, mm -hmm. the humidity in the air, and the amount of moisture in your breath. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, I was like, if you can see your breath, can <sighs> you see your farts in the cold? Because- that's, that's a, a very logical question. question. No, that's a fair right? question. This is, okay. this is why Stacy needs to visit the labs. Yeah, this is why she's a lab person. So that's how she thinks. So I I did some research, and the Ooh. answer is your farts okay. are not humid enough to uh -huh. show. So that Wait, is you why really you really did run an experiment on this. I didn't oh, actually oh, like you didn't wander around and like not, you, you, you talked to a librarian who I pulled out was... the necessary documentation. Oh, okay, to I, tell you. I, yeah. I, I had a conversation <laughs> with my science teacher and that was something that he was like, well, yeah, let's, let's learn about this. Hmm. And we did. Interesting. That's all. I wonder why there's less humidity there than there is in the lungs. Um, well, there's, I mean, your mouth has more moisture than. Oh, true. <laughs> I was like, we could do this, but I don't know if we want <laughs> no, that's to. Okay. That's okay. Um, folks, that is going to bring us to the end of this episode of This Week in Google. Um, I appreciate you all for being here with us. If you are not currently a member of Club Twit, could I invite you to join the club? It's a weird club. You'll love it. It's twit.tv slash club twit, $7 a month. And joining the club helps, helps us continue to do these wonderful, important things we're doing here on the network. Uh, when you do join the club, you get access to some pretty awesome benefits. Every single Twit show ad free. It's just the content. You also get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special club Twit events get published there, and access to the members only Discord server, a fun place to go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. If that's not enough, there's also access to the video versions of our Club Twit exclusive shows. So checking those out is only possible by being a member. Again, $7 a month, twit.tv slash Club Twit. We'd love to have you join us. Stacy Higginbotham, if folks want to keep up with what you're doing, where do they go to do that? Oh, I'm on Blue Sky as Giga Stacy. Probably is the best place to find all of me. Awesome, awesome. And um, anything else you want to you want to pitch? Should we just put good thoughts out into the universe for the your your darling that you have um, you know sent along to the FTC, so to speak? Well, stay tuned because I will be releasing new research, like like maybe this week, maybe the beginning of next week, on kind of this topic. And awesome. also, if you are in a position to think about longevity by design, feel free to share like your thoughts with me because I want to hear them. Awesome. And Jeff Jarvis, uh, what about you? How do they get in touch? How do they get your book? Where do they go? So for the current books that are out, gutenbergparenthesis.com with discount codes there. And as soon as my son Jake does my site, I'll have all three books on one place, but I don't yet. So if you want to Google the way we weave in my name, you will come to the Hachette site. And there, if you put in the code web20 to pre-order, you'll get a 20% discount. And it goes away when it's published next month. So you might want to do it now. Hop on it, folks. Um, you can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Thanks again for being here this week. And um, I... I think I will... Oh, no, no, no. I will not be seeing you all next week, but we will have an awesome host of the show uh, nonetheless. So thank you, and I'll catch you again in the future. Bye-bye. <laughs>